Well, let me get started, get this panel started. Uh, I'm John Richter. I serve as the chair of the uh, Federalist Society's Criminal Law and Procedure Executive uh, Committee, which is responsible for uh, pulling this panel uh, together. Um, and I'm privileged to introduce our moderator, Judge Stefanos Bibas. Uh, he's a graduate of Columbia, Oxford, and Yale Law, and uh, before assuming the bench, uh, clerked on the Fifth Circuit, the Supreme Court, practiced privately, and served as an assistant United States attorney in the Southern District of New York. And then he turned to academia, where he served as a law professor at Iowa, Chicago, and Penn. He's earned a reputation since assuming the bench in 2017 for the quality and clarity of his legal writing. And his statements about who and what leads him as a judge are particularly pertinent to the theme of our panel today. Uh, which involves the rule of law. Speaking at William & Mary Law School in 2019, Judge Bebas stated, quote, my boss is not my chief judge. My boss is not my appointing president. My boss is the Constitution and the laws, unquote. Please welcome uh, Judge Bebas. Thank you for the kind introduction. Since I am sworn to uphold the law, I will, in fact, ask to enforce DC's law. Um, we are all required to be wearing masks inside. Uh, criminal justice, 2021, and the rule of law. Very important topic. For a long time, we, many people assumed that the job of police was to make as many arrests as they can, and police often have been measured on that. And the job of prosecutors was long assumed to be to make as many uh, charges and convictions as they could. And prosecutors have often been measured and campaigned on that. And in recent years, we've seen something very interesting going on in the, the different states, the cities, the laboratories of experiment, experimentation and democracy. We've seen what used to be sky-high incumbency advantages for prosecutors turn into contested races, sometimes uh, along issues with some so-called progressive prosecutors coming in and saying they want to explore alternatives to prioritizing maximum arrests and charges and, and, and convictions. Um, and there have been a number of cities across the country that have elected prosecutors campaigning on some version of this. Sometimes it bears on the war on drugs. Sometimes it bears on uh, what to do about innocence claims. Sometimes it bears on what to do about uh, police uh, excessive force and abuse. And in this most recent election, just a few days ago, there were a number of elections in which both mayor elections and DA elections, this was, this was an issue. Now, there are many perspectives you might have on this. One traditional perspective, as I said, might be, well, doesn't the rule of law and ordered liberty mean enforcing the law, enforcing the law as, within the bounds allowed by the law? Is this a, a subversion of the law? Does it send a message that might undercut deterrence? Uh, but there are other perspectives that might say no, as a matter of feder federalism and experimentation, some people choosing to take different approaches, different approaches to, to the war on drugs, maybe lesser or no enforcement. Is that fidelity to the prosecutor's role, or is that a subversion of the role? Is that, in fact, what our uh, federal system is supposed to embrace, or does it involve, in fact, uh, undercutting fidelity to the law? To, to discuss these important and timely questions, we have a very distinguished panel, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce them. I'll give very, their bios could go on at great length. I'm gonna give just very brief two-sentence introductions. The meat of this program will have opening statements that are short, three to five minutes, in the hopes that we can have a lot of discussion back and forth, and then open it up to questions from the floor for the last portion of our panel. So first, we're going to have, um, Mr. McGregor, or Greg Scott, who's a partner at King & Spaulding, where he specializes in assisting companies facing government investigations and litigation. He previously served as the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of California. To his left is uh, Mr. Larry Krasner, who's currently the Philadelphia District Attorney. He started his career as a public defender before serving as Philadelphia's, in the federal, Philadelphia Federal Public Defender's Office. He then transitioned to private practice where his work focused on criminal defense and police misconduct. Then to his left, we'll have Mr. Rich Stanek, who's a founding member of the Public Safety Strategies Group. 
where he works with local and national public safety organizations. And before that, he was for three terms sheriff of Hennepin County, Minnesota, which I believe is where Minneapolis is, and a captain in the Minnesota Police Department. And then finally, to his left is my dear friend, Professor Tracy Mears, who's the Walter Hale Hamilton Professor and a founding director of the Justice Collaboratory at Yale Law School. She's a nationally recognized expert on policing in urban communities, and her research focuses on how members of the public think about their relationship with the police, prosecutors, and judges. So without any further ado, Mr. Scott, please. Thank you, Your Honor. And if I could uh, very briefly say to my fellow veterans in the room, happy Veterans Day and thank you for your service. You Judge mentioned the rule of law, but also uh, in the description of today's panel is the term ordered liberty which by definition means uh, that individual freedom is limited by the need for order in society, a reconciliation of the conflicting demands of public order and personal freedom. And that's what our criminal justice system tries to do every day is to strike that balance to achieve ordered liberty for our citizens. Rule, the rule of law, I submit, is the cornerstone of the concept of ordered liberty. But the rule of law only works when each of the branches of our government tasked with a role in it stays in that branch's lane. Public prosecutors have a central role in striking that proper balance. I will submit today, and with due, uh, due respect to my new friend, Mr. Krasner, um, I have a couple of criticisms of the progressive prosecutor movement, or as my friends at the Heritage Foundation call it, the rogue prosecutor movement. <laughs> Uh, that in two fundamental ways, progressive prosecutors uh, fail in their traditional roles as public prosecutors, and in turn, thus fail in enforcing the rule of law, and in turn, ordered liberty. The cornerstone of our government is the separation of powers, and without it, we cannot have ordered liberty. This concept of the legislature legislates the executive enforces and the courts interpret is fundamental. It goes back to kindergarten, we learn these things. And I think it's best captured perhaps by Article 3, Section 3 of the California State Constitution, which reads, the powers of the state government are legislative, executive, and judicial. Persons charged with the exercise of one power may not exercise either of the others except as permitted by this Constitution. When progressive pro prosecutors unilaterally choose not to enforce whole categories of crimes or use statutory sentencing enhancements which are available to them, they usurp the proper role of the legislature in our system. Now, some will say it's prosecutorial discretion, but that simply is not accurate. Prosecutorial discretion is something that is undertaken on a case-by-case -case analysis looking at the specific facts and law of a particular case, not the wholesale failure to enforce the laws in a particular category. Simply put, if you want to change the law, run for the legislature, not DA. The second foundational piece these prosecutors have abandoned is the proper role of the district attorney in our system of criminal justice. Let me be clear. The ultimate responsibility of a prosecutor is, in the famous words of Justice Jackson, to see that justice is done. The best thing, many times, a criminal defendant can have is a smart, ethical prosecutor on the other side who understands and completely embraces that responsibility. However, ours is an adversarial system. That is why criminal cases in the state of California are captioned, the people of the state of California versus John Smith. In Pennsylvania, they are captioned the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania versus William Jones. I think this description of the role of the elected district attorney on the website of the California District Attorneys Association captures this point that I'm trying to make. The primary role of the district attorney is to protect the community he or she is elected to serve. District attorneys represent the public and endeavor to improve public safety by prosecuting those who threaten the well-being of the community and its citizens by breaking the law. A few weeks ago, two senior prosecutors in the office of San Francisco District Attorney Chesa Bodine resigned. One of them, a self-described progressive prosecutor, 
has now joined the recall effort against Mr. Bodine because she was very disturbed by what she saw going on in the office. And this is one quote from the San Francisco Chronicle from her. His goal appears to be what is best for the individual who has been arrested for a crime or who has been charged with a crime, but not what is best for San Francisco. Recently in the LA Times, a chief of police in Southern California was quoted as saying, what we are seeing from our officers on the street is that criminals don't feel like they have to face any consequences. Now, this is not academic or theoretical, this deviation from the traditional role of the public prosecutor in the rule of law and in turn ordered liberty. There are consequences. In jurisdictions which have elected progressive prosecutors, the homicide rates have been exceeding long before anybody had heard of COVID. Baltimore, Philadelphia, Chicago, St. Louis, Los Angeles, all experiencing homicide rates which have not been seen in decades. Last year, Baltimore had its highest per capita homicide rate ever. It is a fact that when the violent crime rate in general and homicides in particular rise, we see a commensurate increase in the number of minority victims. How ironic it is that those who suffer most from violent crime on a daily basis from this deviation from the assigned role in the rule of law are minority communities who progressive prosecutors claim to care about most. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. I just talk and see the work, yeah. Hello. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. Certain people told me, do not walk into the lion's den, but I like lions. <laughs> So I, I'm down here. Perhaps I'll make it out of here. Um, but I really did want to come down here, and I really did want to speak to you for a couple of reasons. Reason one is if I were not here, then progressive prosecutors in general could be made into these two-dimensional cartoon characters, something I've seen many, many times. Same reason I went to speak to the police union in Philadelphia during my campaign, even after I said I would not accept the endorsement of its leadership. You have to talk to people. You have to let them know what you stand for. And sometimes it turns out that there's a lot of common ground. I actually think there probably is a lot of common ground. Let me get one thing out of the way, though, before, before it sets in cement. Because one aspect of progressive prosecutors is that we believe in data. We believe in transparency. We believe in the facts. It is not at all factual that there's a higher rate of violent crime or gun crime in progressive prosecutors' jurisdictions. That is completely false. If you look at the top 50 cities in the United States in the year 2020, the average increase in gun violence was 42%. The average increase in the United States was 20%. People were killing people in rural areas as well. And if you went to Philadelphia, my jurisdiction, we were at 40%. We were at average or a little bit less than average. John Pfaff, the um, rather impressive professor of law at Fordham and also professor of economics, did an in-depth analysis of the top 50 cities and he discovered there's absolutely no correlation whatsoever between the increase in violent crime and whether you are a traditional prosecutor or a progressive prosecutor. So I say that just because um, I think we should get that out of the way. Now moving on, I believe that there are a lot of people in this room who sincerely believe that government should be limited, that government should act with restraint, and that there should be more freedom, not less, consistent with public safety. That is also something that I believe. When we talk about the rule of law, it can mean a lot of things. But I'll tell you one thing it definitely does not mean. It does not mean that all of you snapped to attention and put on your masks. Because I'm looking out, and half of you should turn yourself in, if that's what it really means. If what it really means that any violation of any law anywhere should be enforced, that is an impossible task and it is not what any traditional prosecutor has ever done in history. The reality of our situation is that we must grasp the context. The United States is the most incarcerated country in the world and yet we claim to be the land of freedom. That is not right. There is something fundamentally wrong with that. If you look at a state like Pennsylvania, while we have seen a 500% increase in incarceration 
in the last 30 to 40 years nationally, Pennsylvania has seen a 750% increase in incarceration over that same period of time. And if you start to talk about what that actually means in economic terms, because it really does matter how we steward society's resources, it really does matter what return on investment we get from the money we spend, then this is what it looks like. One year of incarceration for one person is gonna cost you, depending on where you are, 50 grand. In Philly, it's actually more, but it's gonna cost you something like that. A year of incarceration for a juvenile in a juvenile facility in Pennsylvania costs about $200,000. So I would like to think that we would be getting something back for that money. My belief, and I don't share it with every progressive, some of them disagree, but my belief is we do need some jails, we do need some prisons, we do need police forces. I believe all of that. And I believe they should be used for the people who need to be in them. But I also believe a couple other things. I believe we should look at modern Germany, where they have one-ninth the level of incarceration, and they have one-ninth the level of homicide. Well, if we're doing everything right, then please explain to me how it is that far less incarceration there and far more investment and rehabilitation, a completely different type of corrections, has led to so much more public safety. And you know the answer, you know where I'm going with this. The answer is when you burn up all your money on incarceration, where it's necessary, and it is necessary some of the time, but more importantly, where it's unnecessary, when you burn up all of that money on those extra judges and extra courthouses and extra probation officers and extra parole officers, when you do that, when you burn it up on certain types of police enforcement that don't make sense, then you don't have it to invest in things that work better. Let me just give you a, a very quick example, and then I'll quit, because I'm at my five minutes. But there is research out there, and we embrace research. We actually have a criminologist in the Philadelphia DA's office for the first time in the history of that office, and we do a ton of data. But there is research out there that indicates, by comparison, if you were to invest a dollar into policing, the benefit you get from that, in terms of safety, is more than a dollar. It's about a dollar ten. That's pretty good, right? That's some return on your investment. But if you take the same dollar and you invest it in drug treatment, the return you get is four dollars. So when we look at safety, we have to not only look at cost, we have to look at the opportunity cost. As we put resources over here, what could they have done over there? I'm gonna to submit to you, and I hope to argue as we proceed, that no American business, no American business that's intelligently run would run the way our criminal justice system runs in terms of being an engine of mass incarceration. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to uh, be here with you at the uh, Federalist Society. You know, over the last couple of weeks, as we, uh, from the panel members, we sent some emails back and forth trying to decide, and I was trying to figure out, well, how am I gonna fit into this panel, right? I mean, these guys are very scholarly. They're really good at what they do. And I thought, well, maybe just an honest and common sense uh, perspective. The perspective of a 37-year police officer, 25 years with Minneapolis Police, the last 12 years a sheriff of Hennepin County, uh, had a chance to serve in the state legislature for five terms. I worked for my governor as his commissioner of public safety. So I had experience both in the legislative and the executive branch. And I thought about, you know, we were supposed to submit a thesis about what our comments would revolve around this afternoon. So I thought about it and went to work. I decided that, you know, law enforcement is quintessentially an executive branch function. It should always be separate from legislative and lawmaking functions. This separation of powers is fundamental for law enforcement. And I think that kind of fits right in with uh, what the other two gentlemen said from maybe different perspectives, but fits right in. You know, I think about the, the concepts of, of rule of law and ordered liberty. They look very different from the distance and safety of a courtroom uh, with weapon screening and bailiffs, security cameras and panic buttons. They take on a whole different perspective than uh, the theoretical underpinnings of a flowing black robe. And that's from, uh, that's from a former sheriff who sat in the courtrooms, who had deputies who did this day in and day out. These concepts take on all new meaning when you are at a First Amendment protest in any major U.S. city across this country. Philadelphia, Minneapolis, Chicago, New York, you name it. With thousands of people exercising their protected rights, it is our role, 
law enforcement's role to keep them safe and protect these civil rights and constitutional rights. But then people in the group start launching Molotov cocktails. They break windows, they start fires. They empty out the property in dozens of stores on the block. Or when the area is fogged with tear gas and rioters no longer are rioters, but they, or no protesters turn into rioters and they refuse your dispersal orders for the third time. Or when these rioters throw cement blocks and bricks at police officers, they start shooting into a police station or start calling your mother names and questioning her heritage, right? Those are the front lines. That's the real common sense approach from law enforcement. And I know you're all gonna agree that law enforcement serves best when it is accountable for the proper and the constitutional enforcement of laws protecting civil rights and civil liberties of all residents. Did you hear me? Accountable for the proper and constitutional enforcement of laws protecting civil rights and civil liberties of all residents. But as law enforcement officers, we need clarity. What is legal and what is not. Without proper enforcement, we have what? Lawlessness. We have to draw very clear lines when all you lawyers, no offense intended, <laughs> tend to want to talk about the gray areas. And we have to draw very clear lines when we're training the young men and women in our agencies, some of whom aren't even 21 years of age. In Minnesota, they have to have a two-year degree. They have to go to a licensing school. They get about six months of on-the-job training before they're put out on the road to enforce those very laws. Uh, I had a young man that worked for me named Sam. Uh, he was a very young guy. I mentored him for a number of years. But when I swore him in at age 20 in Minnesota, he wasn't even legally able to carry a firearm as yet. But nonetheless, he's doing well today. There was nothing gray about a law enforcement officer's oath to uphold and enforce the law. Police officers are the keepers of the peace, and we must keep everyone safe. In these instances, that is our mission. And yes, we certainly have discretion when it comes to making an arrest, but we also need the law to be uh, applied equally and fairly to everyone. This concept of rule of law, order of liberty, or if you're a police officer, law and order, depends on police enforcing our laws as they've been adopted. Discretion in this process undermines this concept of the rule of law. For example, foreclosures on a home or evictions, those are judicial orders. And just because you know, mom has several kids and she's gonna be evicted or foreclosed out of her home, doesn't mean that law enforcement can't help her out, maybe pay for a hotel, give her some food for money, help her kids trans, you know, uh, move on to something else. But nonetheless, we've got a job to do. We enforce those judicial orders. The same thing with criminal laws and county city ordinances from the legislative branch. Law enforcement officers, chiefs, sheriffs, others, we do not make laws, but as experts, we can advise and confer regarding the development of policy and laws. This rule of law is undermined when it depends upon you elect as to whether or not the laws are meaningful. And some example are what Immigration laws, for example. Federal enforcement responsibility, but often not supported at the local level. Should local law enforcement support federal law enforcement mission? Many sheriff's races across this country have come down to this very issue when it comes time every four years for their reelection. Trespass and violent riots, you know, the tragic George Floyd death in Minneapolis, arrest and book or ignore violence, property damage and looting, cite and release. You know, there were hundreds and hundreds of individuals who were cited for looting, theft, uh, refusal to obey dispersal orders. All those charges were dismissed at the end of the day before they even got to court. They weren't even booked into jail because a mayor or activist city council decided through their city attorney, who's appointed by them, that there wasn't to be the case. And look at the consequences. Residents and businesses in Minneapolis, the, the owners watched as the city burned, and now they don't trust and they will not be safe there. They're closing their businesses and they're moving out in mass. If we do not support the intent and the effect of our criminal laws, the solution is to change the laws, not simply ignore them. I think I heard that about five minutes ago, if I'm not mistaken. More and more local legislative bodies, those city councils and those county boards are invading the province of executive powers by usurping the management of the police department and the sheriff's offices. Just two weeks ago, on November 2nd, uh, this year's elections, Minneapolis had a referendum to abolish and defund their local police department. 
You know, that city charter was put in place to guarantee the number of police officers and the funding per resident in their city. It would have eliminated the guaranteed funding and it would have left it to policy makers to determine whether police or public safety or social workers were needed. Recently, Loudoun County's uh, Virginia Board of Supervisors wants to remove all of the law enforcement authority from the sheriff's office. And by the way, the sheriff in Loudoun County, the Commonwealth of Virginia, is a constitutional officer. And they want to place it in the hands of a police chief that they will directly supervise. They want to exercise both the legislative and the executive authority. The independent office of the sheriff dates back to before our nation's founding. And you'll see it included in many state constitutions to protect against its encroachment of the legislative branches of local government. So, as I said when I started, law enforcement is quintessentially an executive branch function and should always be separate from legislative and lawmaking functions. This separation of powers is fundamental for law enforcement. Thank you. Okay. Well, I had some thoughts about what I was going to say. Um, Judge Bebas kindly put me at the end of the, of the roster so that I could respond to some of the comments uh, of the speakers. I think where I'm going to begin is as an academic, and I'm going to make three points. One, a point about the constitutional law of ordered liberty. Second, a point about the science of individual compliance with the law. And a third point about how to integrate those two things given the fact that the rule of law is often a response to the ways in which legal authorities over time have abused the notion of law and order. But before I make those three points, I want to make sure that everybody in the room knows that in addition, In addition to being an academic, I also do work on the ground. I've worked with police agencies all across the country. I currently serve on the monitoring team for the Baltimore Police Department, and I run a research center um, that actually uh, puts out lots of different strategies and policies for legal institutions that are policing prosecutors, and so on. So the first point about ordered liberty. That term actually comes from um, constitutional law decisions in which the court was grappling with an interpretation of due process and trying to figure out whether one could interpret due process guarantees as against um, interpretations of the Bill of Rights. The strongest proponents um, of that idea of ordered liberty were Justices Harlan and Frankfurter. And what they tried to do was to talk about the importance actually of the legitimacy of law and what it meant to encourage people to try to voluntarily abide by the law as government agents tried to balance the goal of enforcing the law, yes, but protecting individual liberties. There's a science to this. There's in the social psychology of procedural justice helps us to understand exactly why people do voluntarily by the, uh, obey the law. Now it's true that threats and consequences can motivate people to abide by the law, but decades of research show that that is not the most effective way actually to motivate people to abide the law and moreover, an overinvestment in those strategies can actually cause people to turn away from obeying the law. What is the most effective way? The most effective way is to encourage legitimacy in the law through four points. One, giving people voice in individual interactions with authorities. You give people an opportunity to tell their side of the story and enacting policy. You give people an opportunity to participate in the development of that. Second, you treat people with dignity and respect and concern for their rights. So with respect to policing, again, you can see and understand why in the many videos that we've seen of people in their interactions with legal authorities being treated disrespectfully, you can understand why they might actually not be motivated to respect the authorities who do that. Third, people care about fair decision-making. They care about transparency. They care about 
a connection between facts and the decision making that a legal authority is making. They care about neutrality. They care that their decision makers are free from bias. And fourth, people care about being able to trust the authorities that they're dealing with. They want to believe that they're going to be treated benevolently in the future. And the way that they make that assessment is by checking against how they are actually being treated by those authorities. The how that they're being treated is much more important than the actual outcome of the decisions that those authorities make. In short, in their interactions with authorities, people want to believe that the authority that they're dealing with believes that they count, and they make that decision based on how they're treated. Now, what does this have to do with the, the connection between the ideas of some of the things that you've heard? Well, it turns out that because so many of the people um, who have less trust in authorities are um, people who are racial minorities, groups that McGregor Scott just brought up, it's actually really important um, in thinking about what legal authorities ought to be doing with respect to their pursuit of ordered liberty, that they are treating groups with dignity and respect, giving them voice, treating them fairly, and making fair decisions. And when that does not happen, those folks don't have uh, a perception that the authorities are legitimate, and they're less likely, actually, to voluntarily obey the law. This is, I think, the crux of the issue when we're talking about ordered liberty and how different groups, different types of authorities, whether you're Larry Krasner or a traditional prosecutor, are carrying out their tasks. And those are the metrics that I would use, at least at a, as a first cut, in assessing whether they are doing it the right way. Last point, um, once we get into a discussion of data, which I'm sure we will, um, I can guarantee you that there is a great deal of data and research uh, that backs up what I'm saying, and I'm happy to give anybody sight and verse. Thank you. Thank you all for those remarks. Uh, let me start by, by asking for some discussion at the broad theoretical level of, of, of separation of power. So one complication here is state constitutional law varies a lot. Many states do not have a, a neat federal tripartite separation of powers. But more generally, I, I think this is a question, I'll, I'll start with Mr. Scott and then I'll, I'll give a version to Mr. Krasner. You know, there are many laws on the books Many of these laws are overbroad, and you, you, I believe you said, Mr. Scott, that uh, if there's a law that's, a crime that's been put on the books or a sentence that's been put on the books, it's a legislature that's made that choice, and prosecutors shouldn't make that choice. But what does that mean for, you know, the routine use of sentence enhancements as plea bargaining chips? There are many state courts that have blessed that, that have said the legislature put it on the books, the prosecutor can use it or not use it. Um, are you suggesting that there's something improper in prosecutors not charging and proving the maximum crime and maximum offense in each case, or is there something improper in, in dropping things as part of a plea bargain? There's, a, I think, a line to be drawn there between the legislature saying something is mandatory and something is discretionary. Mm -hmm. and, and many times that's what the legislatures have done and my point was that all too often what we're seeing now, specifically in Los Angeles County with Mr. Gascon, is the wholesale uh, rejection of the enhancement scheme that's been set up by the state legislature, which is resulting in amazingly lenient sentences for very violent criminals who need to spend a lot of time in prison because of what they have done to individuals in our society. So, so again, I come back to the fundamental point, which is the legislature creates the, the, the measurement. Is it discretionary? Is it mandatory? All right, let me, let me take a version of that question to Mr. Krasner. I believe you campaigned and won office on a platform that was in part that you were not going to enforce uh, marijuana crimes, correct me if I'm wrong, under, under any circumstances. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you have not in fact been uh, doing so under those laws. Uh, is, that a, is that defensible given that the state legislature has, has criminalized marijuana 
uh, use and possession? So I would never call a judge wrong, but, but that is a little imprecise, even though it's not entirely wrong. Uh, at the time I took office, the city council had already passed what was essentially a ticket for the possession of marijuana. We prosecute marijuana sales, always have, but they passed what was essentially a ticket. Instead of being charged with a misdemeanor offense and going through a court process, a ticket was written, you pay 25 bucks, that's that. And in that process, which all happened before I got into office, 80% of those marijuana cases came out of the docket of the DA's office. That was about 5,000 cases used to be for possession of marijuana. Uh, when I came in, what I did is I looked at this 20%, this thousand or so cases remaining, figured out they were being prosecuted for frankly no good reason, which was simply that they were cases in which people had bought marijuana on the street uh, for their own personal use. I saw no distinction there. And so we uh, have declined to prosecute them with a rare exception. If, if we do in fact catch Pablo Escobar with a little bit of weed, we're gonna prosecute Pablo Escobar because we're, we're gonna take whatever handle we have to get a hold of him. But yes, we've done that. We have also done that with the crime of prostitution in Philadelphia. We do not prosecute mostly women who engage in sex work because frankly, we consider them to be victims of a system, not the ones who need to be put in a jail cell. It does nothing to help them get out of that life or address the issues that they often have. So we have made decisions in a couple of areas not to do that, but understand the context. We are in a context where both Republicans and Democrats want to legalize recreational marijuana for adults. They both want to do it. They're having a tug of war over whether it goes for tax breaks, I'll let you guess which party that is, or it goes for public education, I, I'll let you guess which party that is too. That's what's going on. So you're, what we're talking about here is, should I prosecute the possession of a beer at the end of prohibition? And you know, I remember the oath I took. The oath was very clearly to seek justice. That was it. It wasn't all these other things that are being layered on there. Uphold the Constitution and seek justice. I think it is 100% just not to go after people vigorously at the end of the, uh, you know, the criminalization of possession of marijuana shortly before it is legalized and becomes very profitable for a whole lot of people who might actually be in this room. Would anyone else like to speak to, the, to, to these points? All right, um, let me go on now to the, uh, maybe I can focus on Mr. Krasner and Mr. Stanek on this, about uh, police prosecutor relations. So historically, police and prosecutors have worked somewhat hand in glove, and, and you could call that cooperative, or you could call it too cozy. Um, you know, with progressive prosecutors, sometimes you've had a more adversarial relationship. I think there have been some, some, some billboards in the Philadelphia area that have expressed such a relationship. Uh, I'm kind of curious, is it a good or a bad thing to have more distance or, or space or, a, or a, 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 a different relationship with police? Mr. Preston. Um, okay, first of all, I'm extremely grateful for those billboards because they got me a lot of votes. <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding, they got me a lot of votes because the way the people feel in Philadelphia is not that they don't like police, a lot of them do like police, I like police. In fact, I have an officer here defending my life against some of you today. <laughs> but Hi, the, Agnes. You know, the, the, the point is that Philadelphians have a very divided relationship in particular with the police union. And there's a reason for that, and it's a reason that happens all over the country. The primary reason is that police unions include all the retired membership, and in Philadelphia, what that's gonna mean is that the leadership of the FOP doesn't need a single vote from a single current active Philadelphia police officer. What they need to do is keep a prior generation with a prior demographic, with a prior politics, happy. And so there is a huge difference between what the, the average current Philadelphia police officer may think, and they all think different things, because stereotypes do in fact fail us, even when we're talking about police officers, they fail us. And what is coming out of the mouths of the leadership of the FOP. Um, you should know that I have twice been endorsed by the Black Officers Association in Philadelphia, which constitutes a very large part of the Fraternal Order of Police. A mandatory membership 
is what they have. I mean, it's a bargaining unit. So every police officer, whether they like the politics of the FOP, which are, in fact, you know, endorsing Donald Trump twice, the leader of the FOP referred to Black Lives Matter as a, quote, pack of rabid animals, unquote. He has defended the visible wearing of Nazi tattoos by officers on duty and in uniform. I could go on. The Proud Boys were invited into FOP Hall, where they drank with the officers in an officers-only section. In my opinion, this doesn't reflect at all in a good way on law enforcement, but that's what he has done. And I don't think his actions in any way describe how the average rank and file police officer thinks. Now having said that, is it a perfect relationship? No, it's not perfect. Uh, it's not perfect because we do hold police officers accountable, something my pre predecessors never did because they didn't keep their oath, which was to seek justice, and seeking justice means equal treatment under the law. Mr. Stanek? Well, uh, I would say that the relationship between law enforcement and prosecutors is always kind of a push-pull relationship, right? Sometimes we work with them, sometimes we find ourselves on opposite ends. I think he just said it, you know, he said, look, if I, if I get an opportunity for a low-level misdemeanor arrest for marijuana, uh, that I wouldn't normally prosecute someone else in the room for, but it's Pablo Escobar, hey, I'm gonna take the shot, right? And then on the other hand, he also has the responsibility of prosecuting those police officers themselves who find themselves uh, you know, uh, in violation of the law. And so this relationship has been going on a long time. Activist prosecutors, whether on the county or the local level, uh, has always been uh, something that you know, law enforcement wishes did not happen, but rather you enforce the laws before you, that you don't interpret the laws according to how you want. Uh, you were elected just like sheriffs were elected, uh, and we both have responsibilities back out to the residents of those counties. Uh, I don't think our responsibilities are any different, uh, but push-pull, that's how I would describe it. Can I just say one word on that? Or you sure, and then Professor. Yeah, I'll be just be real fast. It's I mean, like a rebuttal. Well, not exactly. You know, <laughs> I was just trying a to go first. For what here's it's the worth. truth. In Pennsylvania, in the last 30 years, we went from 1,000 criminal offenses to almost 5,000 criminal offenses. If what you're saying is you have to prosecute everything all the time, including all those of you who have your mask off, if that's what you're saying, then it is an unsustainable burden. And no one has ever said that to a traditional prosecutor. This is how we get a 500% increase in incarceration in the United States during a 30-year period when crime declined for 30 years. This is how we get there, because there's a good politics in fear, there's a good politics in anecdotes without facts, and there's a good politics in constantly saying, punish, 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 punish. I just wanted to make a small point about the separation, which is it is not necessary, of course, that the DA uh, be the prosecuting agency that deals with police misconduct. And in fact, when I served on the President's Task Force in 21st Century Policing, one of the recommendations that we made was that there would be independent prosecutors or that these prosecutions would take place at the state level. It's actually a very easy to solve this problem. And then you don't actually have to have the kind of push-pull which would also be consistent with the rule of law. Mr. Scott, did you want to say So I think much of this discussion touches on when there's an officer use of deadly force and that relationship between the prosecutor's office and the, and the police department. And um, uh, in California, that authority has been given to the state attorney general in just the last legislative term uh, where the person against whom the deadly force was used did not have a, a deadly weapon or a firearm. But in that context, there's a general misunderstanding in the public about what is the legal standard that's been established by the United States Supreme Court for a police officer to use deadly force. And uh, we had an interesting situation in Sacramento shortly after I became U.S. Attorney. The second time, uh, a young African-American male by the name of Stephon Clark was shot and killed by the Sacramento Police Department. And it was highly controversial. He was not armed. He had a cell phone. It was at night. They thought, it, And so that's where we were. The state attorney general was asked by the DA to come in and help her with that review and that investigation. And as you can imagine, in California, we don't elect traditional prosecutors as the attorney general anymore. We just don't do that. And so Mr. Becerra, who's now the secretary of, I think, HHS, 
uh, his team came in and looked at it as well. And, and then when they were all done, we, the feds, looked at it for a potential civil rights violation. And it, I'm just going to tell you, it was a very eye-opening experience for Mr. Becerra to have to learn exactly what the standard is as set by, as forth by the United States Supreme Court. And so it's easy to criticize that relationship, but we also have to remember that the DA has to go by the legal standard that has been established and apply it to the facts. And all too often, I think there's a great conflating of those two things in the public. Let, let's talk a little bit about federalism and subfederalism. Uh, we're used to these we have federal laws, but then we've got state criminal laws. There are some municipal ones. Then we elect DAs at the county level, but police chiefs are often picked by the mayor at the, the local level. Um, what about the, 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 we have these many places in which there's a more progressive city against, uh, in a more conservative state. Um, is the, is, is the variation in there good? Let me, maybe we can start with Mr. Scott because California has this famous experiment going on called realignment in which different counties have decided to adopt different approaches, some of them for, for non-serious, non-violent, non-sex crimes, some of them taking a more you know, traditional uh, arrest and punish approach, some of them deciding to take a more treatment or, or decarcerative approach. Uh, is it is it good, is it valuable for cities to have flexibility this way, or is it, is it a, a source of problems or, or disrespect for state law? Well, again, as Mr. Krasner said, I, I never like to disagree with a judge, but uh, that discretion really does not rest at the local level. It's a product of, uh, in recent years, we've had a number of statewide propositions and pieces of legislation which have done the things that you just said, mm -hmm. not at the local level. So. Uh, so th th that really is not what we're dealing with there. Um, and uh, uh, realignment is, the concept was that uh, felons in nonviolent crimes would be housed for the duration of their terms in the county jail, not sent to state prison. And uh, I think there are, uh, there's a wide range of opinions whether that has succeeded or not. And um, we've had the follow on Prop 57, which uh, reduced many felonies to misdemeanors. And um, that was uh, the, the now infamous provision, which makes it a misdemeanor to steal up to $949.99 worth of goods every day with no consequences. So the famous videos that you've seen coming out of San Francisco of the man on the bicycle with a big grocery bag full of stuff riding out. The, the people who went into Neiman Marcus and stole all the purses and ran out and jumped in the getaway cars. Uh, so so there is a, there's a huge um, level of discourse and debate about whether these reforms have worked and what they have done. And so, but the point I would make is it's not so much uh, the police departments or the sheriff's departments, the rubber meets the road at the DA's office because that's where the decisions to charge the crime are gonna be made. The cops see a crime, they're going to arrest. Uh, but then it gets sent to the DA's office. So that's where the decisions are going to be made to do these things. The point I wanted to make, too, on you, you asked about sentencing enhancements earlier, and I'll make this very brief. Uh, the, the, it's, I think it's very fascinating, very interesting, that the, uh, the, the Assistant District Attorneys Association of Los Angeles County actually brought a lawsuit against the elected DA about his policies in terms of using enhancements in serious felony cases. And at the trial level, the judge ruled in favor of the deputy DAs. And that's now up on appeal. But that shows the battle that's, that's going on um, within the state. So I'm very tempted to say a couple words about my friend George Gascone, who is in fact the district attorney in LA previously, the district attorney in San Francisco. A lot of people lose sight of the fact that George Gascon was a beat cop in Los Angeles, and then he was a chief of police in Mesa, Arizona, and San Francisco. And the way he became DA is that he got a law degree many years into his career, and when Kamala Harris became the AG, he was appointed. We are talking about a career police chief, yep. a career cop, who is being described as some kind of bomb throwing, not described by you, but described by others as some kind of bomb throwing radical. That is nonsense. 
What actually is going on here is that based on a very long experience in criminal justice dealing with police as their chief, he knows the problems. He's trying to change the problems. And he is up against, as we all are, who are progressive prosecutors, he's up against institutions that are not aligned with people. Now, why do I say people? I say people because 10, 12 years ago, there were zero progressive prosecutors in the United States who were identifiable. Two years ago, 10% of the United States lived in a jurisdiction with a progressive prosecutor. Today, 20.1. It's been two years. You've seen an increase. If we were to form a political party, progressive prosecutors would be the most successful political party in the United States. That's the truth. This is not coming from us. We are not extraordinary people. This is coming from people who are disgusted with mass incarceration, the incredible damage that it has done throughout our society, the violations of our liberty. There is no bigger government than a government that locks up people all over the country unnecessarily. So that is where all this stuff is coming from. Now, I'm sure you had another question that I forgot. Oh, I was just asking about relations between states and, 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 and cities and counties. So obviously, you know, there are issues in Philadelphia. Philadelphia doesn't get to set its own, you know, gun policy and other things. What's your attitude about, you know, Philadelphia striking off in a different direction from the way in which, you know, some of the, the statewide laws are are, are written or, or other DAs in Pennsylvania are, are doing things? Well, I think you raise a very, very important point, which is that there is an argument that what's happening in, in places like Chicago and Brooklyn and now Manhattan, where we have progressive prosecutors, is a kind of a micro-federalism. Um, hopefully it's accompanied by science and not just you know anecdotes and not just what bleeds leads, because that is the history of criminal justice. It has been completely unscientific, never moored to the truth. And that's kind of how we got here. Um, but I think to the extent that you do real research and you do these things that are considered by some experimental, frankly, they look a lot like exactly what we used to do in the United States 50 years ago when we didn't have a 500% increase in incarceration. To the extent you can do those experiments and then you can test them independently and then you can see if they work or not, when they work, there now becomes a basis for legislation that would take it in. I mean, for, just to be very quick about it, there is a jurisdiction where there has been a no cash bail system for 30 plus years. It's here. It's the District of Columbia. There's a lot of science in that that says a lot of good things about a system where you are either held pretrial, which 12% of defendants are in DC, or you are released and money's got nothing to do with it, right? But the only way that you can do that experiment is by doing that experiment. So I think that there is, there is a lot of good to be had in the micro-federalism of progressive prosecution. Professor Mears, could you pick up on the laboratories of democracy? Are the data proving to be useful? What can we learn from them? Sure, but I wanted to say something about the relationship between city government, county government, and state government. And to do that, um, I want to invoke a book by our good friend, um, William Stuntz called The Collapse of Criminal Justice. If you haven't read it, I recommend it to you. But Bill um, noted that w one of the sort of uh, problems that we have in administering our system was that laws, criminal laws, are primarily made at the state level, um, that prisons, or, or at least prosecutors, sometimes prisons, are administered at jails at the county level, prisons at the state level, police um, are, are organized at the city level, and the disjuncture between all of these things is, is incredibly difficult. I don't think it's actually true, Greg, that a police officer who sees someone breaking a state law is automatically going to arrest them. In fact, I'm confident that that's not true. Given um, all of the research that I've done, it's possible that it's true. But then there are situations in which um, to ameliorate that problem, then the, the, the police department is required to come up with its own, essentially, administrative law policy to address the, you know, the issues of potential um, over-enforcement, at least from the police officer's perspective. And I know George Gascon. He and I served on a Harvard executive session of public safety about 15 years ago. I know I don't look that old, but really I am. Um, and he cared very deeply about the kinds of issues that you are worried about with respect to public safety and concern for racialized communities in particular, but also uh, a concern about doing it fairly and the ways in which 
our government operates at different levels makes this incredibly difficult. At the same time, I don't think anybody thinks that we want to have a national police force or even a state police force, right? That's France, actually. Um, that's not the United States. And so I think that the best answer to this is actually allowing executives of these offices to um, use their discretion, but they should do it at the direction um, and, and in consultation with relevant communities who are impacted both by the problems that the enforcement of law seeks to address, that is interpersonal violence, but also uh, the costs of the very policy instruments that are used to address those issues. So um, continue on this, this, this issue of, of, of uh, data and what we know. Professor Mears, you, you make very important points about legitimacy. Um, but you can run legitimacy arguments multiple ways. We ultimately have to, to know more about the data. I mean, one thing is, if criminal laws are multiplying and overbroad, if, if we went in and arrested everybody in this room who's not wearing a mask, I think there would be a sense of, what, you're doing that? On the other hand, when people see that laws are widely being flouted, people are walking out of stores in San Francisco, or you know, there's just a tent springing up everywhere, there's also a sense among a number of people, like what has happened to public order, ordered liberty? Um, so you want a sense that your people, in fact, are safe and they perceive themselves to be safe. What, what do we know and what can we generalize about how to strike a sweet spot that's not viewed as excessively punitive, but also doesn't just undercut that sense that, hey, everybody else is following the law, I should follow the law too. Right. Well, the research isn't really about the sweet spot. Um, judge, that's so weird to call you judge because I don't really, since <laughs> when we see each other elsewhere. Um, but anyway, there, it's not about a sweet spot, right? It's really about processes, actually. And so I would say the sweet spot itself is produced when the relevant institutions are committed to the principles that actually support their own legitimacy. And the principles that support their own legitimacy are not having an orientation um, that the best way to ensure that people obey the law is to threaten them with severe consequences for their failure to obey it. That research is quite clear. The commitment to the four principles that I mentioned at the outset of the panel is truly the best way. And it's a commitment that almost, it's, that should be adopted by every relevant institution, because again, the research is quite clear that these are general principles, whether we're talking about police, whether we're talking about judges, whether we're talking about prosecutors, whether we're talking about public school teachers, by the way. My colleague, Tom Tyler, and I, who run together the Justice Collaboratory, Tom, Tom has written a book called Why Children Obey the Law. And again, I know I keep um, picking on you, uh, Greg, but you mentioned something about kindergarten earlier today. The first authority that a child encounters other than her parents is a school teacher. And so it's incredibly important that these kinds of authorities abide by these four principles so that kids, then adults, will be properly socialized into voluntary adherence of the law. And if you do that, um, then people will internalize that obligation. Now, presumably, uh, you know, there's a number of you who actually don't believe that that law is legitimate and you haven't internalized it. I don't know if it's because you don't believe the substantive law is legitimate or if you don't believe that the person who is dictating to you the law um, is legitimate. But um, the research shows that when those authorities do follow these precepts, on average, um, folks are likely to internalize. Last point, if they don't, right, then um, authorities have to resort to deterrence. And that's not a great state of affairs, and it's incredibly expensive. Can, can you give some more concrete examples what makes it more legitimate? I mean, uh, are, are you talking about community policing meetings? Are you talking about training police and prosecutors to talk to people respectfully and solicit their views? Like, what yes. kinds of things do you suggest implementing? Well, that's a first. Um, transparency is incredibly important. Um, giving people reasons for what you do, not simply saying do it because I said so. 
Um, in the research, we call this being authoritative rather than authoritarian. Authoritarian will backfire every single time. All right. Let, did anyone want to respond? I just want to go to that last point you made about transparency, because I completely agree with that. And um, uh, I should mention, I was an elected DA once upon a time before I was U.S. Attorney, and a deputy DA before that, so I come from the state perspective as well as the federal. And while the elected DA, I thought it was incumbent, when appropriate, to publicly speak out on decisions that we were making in the office uh, and why we were doing things and to try to spur that sense of transparency within the community so that the taxpayers, the citizens, everyone understood this is the decision that's been made by the DA's office and this is why they made it in, in that spirit to promote that sense of transparency. Anything else on this? All right, let's talk about uh, the recent news. Uh, now, this past week, on the one hand, uh, Mr. Krasner won re-election by a very large margin. Uh, there were also a number of other cities across the country where both mayoral and, and DA races uh, seemed, uh, or at least have been read, as uh, you know, rejecting various progressive prosecutors. There was a Republican who defeated the progressive candidate in Seattle City Attorney race. I gather that might, uh, this is a misdemeanor uh, DA. There's Minneapolis rejecting a pro proposal to overhaul the police department. Um, there was, you know, in, in Buffalo, this was one of the issues. I gather there's a recall effort in, uh, in, in San Francisco for the DA there. Um, some people are calling this a repudiation of progressive policies. What, what does the panel make of this? Can we, can we tell anything uh, more generally from this series of local races? Well, I'm happy to mouth off as usual. Uh, <laughs> so two years ago, the spotlighted progressive prosecutor race, the one that the institutional media and uh, opposing party built up to be the Waterloo for progressive prosecution was Kim Fox in Chicago running for reelection easily reelected by more than 10 points with her opponent spending a ton of money, a ton of money more than she had. Year after, the race was, will Gascon take over in Los Angeles, which is the largest criminal justice jurisdiction in the United States against an incumbent. He won, he actually won fairly easily at that time. Uh-oh, no Waterloo. And then my race was considered the spotlighted race. And uh, I won the primary with two out of every three votes and the general with almost three out of every four. And more important than that, and this is not about me, but it is about how people feel about criminal justice and how they will vote. More important than that, when you went to the neighborhoods most affected by gun violence during a terrible national spike, but also a spike in Philly in gun violence, I got 80 to 85% of the vote in those areas. People do not buy that stamping your foot and saying I'm gonna hang you high solves anything. And they don't buy it because they've lived in those neighborhoods, they've experienced it, and they know that it doesn't solve anything, that we have to go a different direction in terms of prevention. So, you know, I think what is probably much more telling than that momentary blip is the reality of what I just said. We've gone from 10% of the US population to 20.1, almost 75 million Americans are living in a jurisdiction where they have selected and reselected a progressive prosecutor. They didn't just select the ideas, that was first, but then they selected the actions. And this includes Baltimore and so many other cities that I could name. Well, I look at it from, a, a, again, just come at it from a common sense approach. I mean, laws are made at the state level by the legislature. I'm not understanding how, because an elected office of a district or a county attorney, not at the state level, can decide not to prosecute or what to prosecute depending on what they told the residents they would do during their election themselves. If they don't want or like the policies of the laws that are in place, I'm not sure why we don't go back and change them at the state level. Uh, law enforcement operates within the bounds that the citizens set for them, and those bounds are set through their elected officials and that process, the legislative process. And third, uh, you talked about Minneapolis for a minute, and I'll just tell you about Minneapolis. I just lived through it. Again, I was a police officer there for 25 years and the sheriff for 12 years. The abolish and defund movement over the last 18 months across this country came to a screeching halt in terms of a vote by the residents of Minneapolis, all 375,000 of them, where they defeated that measure 60 to 40. 60 percent to 40 percent. They said, look, Law enforcement needs reform. Uh, law enforcement needs 
some help. But in no way, shape, or form did they say they don't want the police. In fact, in some of the neighborhoods like North Minneapolis, one of the four police precincts, 75 plus percent of the African Americans who live in that precinct and citywide said, we don't want less police officers, we want more. It wasn't just a couple weeks ago where they sent a letter to the governor of Minnesota asking for National Guard troops and state troopers. Their neighborhood is under siege. We've had 84 murders already this year, the same amount that we had last year at this time. It's about 150% increase year to date, whereas the national average tells you it's about a 30% increase in homicides across the country in major U.S. cities. We've had over 650 people wounded by gunfire. Over 200,000 rounds have been fired, counted by what they call shot spotter, which is you know the gunshot detection systems. Uh, these neighborhoods are under are under siege, and they want they wanted help. They want more police, not less. They want reasonableness, not activism, not progressive. Uh, four, if not five, of the city council members lost their reelection bids as a result of this, which was a good thing for most of those residents in Minneapolis. Yes. Unless you want to go. No, first. please go ahead. Okay. First, just a factoid. Um, DA Kresner is referring to the numbers of people who now uh, are living jurisdictions um, with prosecutors deemed progressive. Here's something that I wasn't aware of. Um, Los Angeles County has more people in it than the state of Georgia. Okay, just to give you perspective. Yeah. That's where that big jump, I think, is probably coming, which is pretty stunning endorsement of uh, this kind of approach. Now, you know, when you ask me, Judge, how do I make sense of what's happening, what I, the way I make sense of it is, in a sense, yeah, repudiation of an idea that people don't want police at all. Um, I think that actually doesn't make sense, but you can also understand why people organized under this slogan. It's much more attractive than chapter 11 for police. Right? That, that's, that's boring um, and incomprehensible uh, to people. But I do think, though, I'm only half joking, but Chapter 11 is about reorganization. And I do think what people are looking for is a reorganization of the state's approach to delivery of public safety. Um, and the reason why I think people are calling for more police is because it's the only thing that many police, pay, many people, in communities that experience what I call safety, safety deprivation, violence is simply one symptom of safety deprivation. deprivation. It's the only thing that they've typically been given from the state um, as a response to their problem, when there could be many other solutions that the state could support. So with respect to violence and addressing interpersonal violence in these communities, we know there are many, many strategies, some of which have been tried in places like Philadelphia and Chicago and elsewhere, community-based solutions that haven't been funded to scale. We could do that, right? We also know that a really fulsome definition of safety would account for better housing, better education, health care, so on. But most people actually don't associate those kinds of goods with provision of public safety, um, and they could, and they should. That's what's going on here. So I want to make two points. You talked about you know the election returns and those kinds of things, and I think the simple point is we all the pendulum does never it never stops. The pendulum moves constantly. In the 90s, in the early 2000s, I agree in large measure it went too far in one direction, but now it has swung way too far back in the other direction. So I think the election results, in a way are the, the, at, least, at least not necessarily swinging back, but at least maybe has paused at the, at the extreme swing to the left. There will be a recall in San Francisco. The number of uh, signatures turned in overwhelmingly exceeds the number required to put it on the ballot. And if I was a betting man today, he will be recalled because there's just a genuine pushback across the board in San Francisco. Now, the second point I wanna make is Mr. Krasner cited repeatedly this afternoon that the number of people in the country represented or, or who have elected progressive prosecutors has grown. That's a fact, I don't dispute that. But the DA typically is an elected official and what does it take to run for office? It takes money. 
And I think a big part of this uh, that needs to be brought out is that Mr. Soros made a brilliant tactical, strategic, political, political decision some years ago to fund people like Mr. Krasner and Mr. Gascon to run for DA. And he has been overwhelmingly successful in that. We talked about George Gascon. He received millions and millions and millions of dollars from Soros and his associates, which made all the difference. You could not turn on the television in LA and not see a George Gascon TV ad in the run-up to the election. So that has to be said, because that is a huge piece of this. And it's an arms race to raise money that traditional prosecutors can't keep up with. So I just wanted to make that point. All right, now I do have to jump in. Um, so, I mean, it is true that George Soros and his foundation uh, in states where he's not permitted to coordinate did that. In my state, there's no coordination permitted. All those of you who thought Citizens United was a good idea, thank you very much. This is, <laughs> this is, you know, this is the world you made. I don't particularly like this world, but if it's, if it's gonna be an infinite river of money going somewhere, guess what? I can't stop a rich guy from liking me. And as it, <laughs> and, and as it turns out, he did. You wanna ask one of your members, Josh Hawley, how he got elected the first time? About half of all of his funds came from one person. So let's not pretend that only one side has money here. I was uh, outspent for the most part in this last election. I had very, very little support coming from the outside. Of the couple million dollars that came in, only about $200,000 were coming from an outside source like that. And my average donation of the thousands and thousands of donations was 50 bucks. My opponent's average donation was about 300 bucks. And those donations overwhelmingly came from Philadelphia. So while it is true that money plays a role, it plays a role for Federalists running for US Senate, it plays a role for progressives running for district attorney, that's true. And there's, you know, frankly, there's nothing that I can do about it until we can get rid of Citizens United, which I would do tomorrow. Let, let me throw out one more question uh, and then we'll, we'll take some for the audience. So please think about them and, and feel free to, to, to line up. Uh, we've seen a massive spike in gun violence and homicides in the past year. And it's so large and, and so sweeping that the national effects swamp whatever the local effects are. What, what would a traditional, what would a progressive, what would a, a data-driven or legitimacy approach tell us about how to bring those numbers down? What, what, if, if, you, if you had any suggestions about how to, how to integrate this with the, you know, an approach of the police and, and, and prosecutors, what would it be? So, well, I'm happy to keep talking, but um, let me just say this. I, I just heard Mr. Stanek say that the average increase in gun violence is 31% this year. It's 11% in Philly, so if you want me to fix your town, just give me a call, okay? <laughs> um, I say, that, I say that in jest because obviously district attorneys don't actually fix crime. We are one of many factors, probably one of the smaller factors. But pretty much every criminologist I've spoken to or read agrees that what happened here is called the pandemic. And when the pandemic happened, all organized sports ended in and out of school, high school classrooms closed, summer camp, summer job programs, job programs for teenagers and poor people, houses of faith closed, their programming closed, normal employment in a low dollar economy got smashed because people making less than 40 grand got, got scorched in the pandemic and people making a lot of money profited during the pandemic. That's the truth. What actually happened here is we saw the stripping away of prevention that we have taken for granted in which we have underinvested. And the minute Philadelphia reopened their classrooms, and we had recreation centers that were open, public swimming pools that were open. The minute that happened, the level of shooting started to fall. It has been falling ever since. A few months ago, we were at a 38% increase over last year. We're now at 11%. So there is, I think there is no question that a very big factor here is prevention. And what we should be taking from this is not let's lock up more people. What we should be taking from this is let's triple the amount of money that we put into those things that obviously were so effective in making things better. But there's also an enforcement piece. And it is true that there is a terrible underinvestment in forensics in a lot of cities, especially, especially Philly. There's a terrible underinvestment. And, and it really wouldn't take that much. It would be about 5% of the Philadelphia police budget 
to have a state-of-the-art lab, three times as big as what we have, that does some absolutely amazing forensics and could solve a lot of these cases before the first shooting turns into the fifth shooting. That is another aspect of it. I mean, there's another factor a lot of people talk about, which is the massive gun buy that occurred uh, after the pandemic started and also occurred to some extent during the unrest after the murder of George Floyd, and it was a murder. There is a, you know, there, that is another factor that is named but we're not gonna get guns under control anytime soon. Let's be honest, even if we did, there's more guns than people in a country of guns, which is what we have. We don't actually have a country of Americans. We have a country of American guns. So that we're not gonna be able to fix. But what we certainly can do is we can invest heavily in, in, um, in, an, in enforcement in the right kinds of ways. We can invest heavily in things that interrupt violence and we can invest heavily in prevention. Who'd like to go next? Well, I'll just I'll, uh, comment briefly. Um, I, I, there's no question that COVID has a big, uh, is a big part of this, but in places like Philadelphia and Baltimore, these homicide rates were increasing dramatically year by year long before 2020 arrived. So it's not one or the other, it can be both. Um, secondly, uh, we need to recognize and our legislators need to recognize that there has been this dramatic increase in violent crime you know, in California, we had a bill uh, to you, if you use a firearm in the commission of a crime, if you brandish it, that can be a 10-year enhancement. If you fire it and, um, in, at someone, it can be a 25-year enhancement. And if you kill someone with it, uh, you know, it can be a life enhancement. Well, there was a bill to reduce that from a 1020, not 25, 1020 life to a 123 enhancement. I mean, what sense does that make in the, in the dynamic that we're facing right now in terms of violent crime, uh, certainly in California. So we need to recognize that, as I said a few moments ago, the pendulum has swung way too far and we need to get back to the middle and find the right balance between, I totally agree, preventive programs, community, I mean, that's the, that has to be a huge part of this, but we also have to hold people who commit violent crimes and murder other people, assault other people, rob other people, accountable for what they have chosen to do. I don't understand is, where the idea comes that we're not doing that. Every progressive prosecutor I know has been very clear that they want to clear the decks on the nonsense so they can focus on the most serious crimes. Where is the study? Where is the data? Where is anything to show me that George Gascon or Rachel Rollins or someone like me is anything less than, than very serious? Well, I'll give you an example. We are right now on a pro bono matter representing an elderly Asian American who was brutally assaulted in San Francisco by a young African-American as an Asian hate crime, no question about it. Uh, he got one year diversion. So that's the kind of thing that we're seeing. That's an anecdote. That's not a study. That's not data. That's a single case. I got 40,000 cases a year. Yes, of, you're going to find some cases where there's a bad outcome. On. Well, how, how do I know that? How do I know you didn't just pull an anecdote out of somewhere? This is what has happened in criminal justice forever. We don't actually use data. We don't actually look at trends. We sure. just pick a single case, even though it's a true story, and I'm sure it's true. And we say, obviously, that's what's happening all over. The truth is that over 30 years, we had a decline in crime in this United States, and 65% of the public every single year believed crime was going up. You want some bad policy? How about this? Brainwash the electorate to believe something that's untrue for 30 consecutive years, and you will have something that I consider a radical experiment, which is mass incarceration. You will have a turning away from what the past was. I would argue that what we're doing is conservative. We're trying to go back to the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, the levels of incarceration we had at that time, which were 20% of what we have now. Would either of other panelists like to chime in? Two points. One, if you want to know what to do, I would read Thomas Abt's book called Bleeding Out, which actually describes very specific strategies to address, um, to address violence. And actually, I'm not going to make the second point. <laughs> Mr. Stanek? No, I want to hear the questions from the real people in the audience. Yeah, All right. All right. So, I mean, I they've been listening to us about <laughs> so, he, rule of law. Here are, here are Judge Bebas's ground rules. State your name briefly, three sentences, must in fact be a question, must end with a question mark, or I'll cut you off. Michael Isaac, I'm from Tampa, Florida. I'm a criminal defense attorney, and I come from a jurisdiction where we have what I would characterize a hyper 
progressive state attorney, who, by the way, was funded by George Soros as well. Uh, as a, uh, a licensed attorney, I took an oath to uphold the Constitution, as did everyone in this room, which includes the Sixth Amendment. So my concern about progressive ideology in prosecution is that everything from a third-degree felony down to a second-degree misdemeanor is divertible. And I think that diversion programs undermine the Sixth Amendment. Why should an individual spend money for a criminal defense attorney when they can walk into court and get a good result? Now, I agree with my colleagues that a null pros or a dismissal is a good result, but you can achieve that same uh, outcome through fair prosecution. The police, criminal defense attorneys police the police. So when you take away the incentive to hire private counsel, no one is pointing out violations of the Fourth Amendment or the Fifth Amendment. Is diversion being overused or abused? It's being underused. Um, and Mr. Isaac, first of all, I appreciate your question. I thank you for it. As a, an ex-criminal defense attorney, I understand we're always looking for business. Um, <laughs> but I, I also think it's fair to say, and I say this to you respectfully and in a friendly kind of way, the system isn't here for us all to make money. It's not here for police to make money in overtime. It's not here for a whole bunch more judges to get hired and get big fat pensions at the taxpayer's expense. It's, I don't see why there's any problem. In my jurisdiction, a third degree felony is liable to be something like a car theft, or it would be a purse snatching with no injury whatsoever and nobody getting knocked down. These are not the most serious offenses in the world. The most serious offenses in the world are shootings, killings, rapes, gunpoint robberies, uh, vicious assaults with knives and fractured skulls and all that sort of thing. I don't see why that's a problem. I do know Mr. Warren, who is your prosecutor. He's an ex-federal prosecutor. Uh, I think you might surpri surprise some of my colleagues by saying he's hyper progressive because a lot of us think he's sort of in that moderate middle. Uh, member of the club to be sure, but he's in that, in that moderate middle, middle. Now I say all of that, sir, respectfully, because I know you're more familiar with what's going on in Tampa. Anyone else on diversion? At, oh, thank you. At the back, microphone. Thank you. you. Uh, Jay Schweikert, Cato Institute's Project on Criminal Justice. Uh, Mr. Scott and Mr. Stanek, both of you uh, have spoken extensively about how you view it as inappropriate to the prosecutor's role to essentially exclude certain categories of crimes from actual prosecution. Um, but you've also spoken extensively about your concerns with rising crime rates. And I guess I was hoping you could address what seems to me like the obvious tension between those two points Namely, if a prosecutor wanted to come in to address public safety and rising crime, wouldn't one sensible way of doing that be to focus exclusively on crimes of property and crimes of violence rather than, say, nonviolent drug possession or consensual sex work? Well, I think we've said for years from a law enforcement perspective that focusing on lower level property crimes, some describe them as lower level, but focusing on property crimes help us from getting to the, uh, the violent crimes, right? That when we look at some of the violent offenses that happen, you'll see a rap sheet like this, right? Two, three, four pages long of minor offenses. Uh, that's one, and then two, I just wanted to go back to one quick thing, and that was about if you wanna reduce incarceration and rates, Give law enforcement, give the public the mental health resources they need, right? You've all heard this over and over and over again, but I'll say it again. Uh, you look at the jails around the country run by the counties or the state department of corrections, and you will see them filled to the brim with those that suffer from treated or untreated mental illness. And in some cases, in some cases, they spend more time going through the criminal justice system because of the mental health issues than the underlying crime by which they were sent there to begin with. That's true. And if you don't give local law enforcement the resources to be able to deal with it and not close state mental health beds, well then they have no option, they have no choice. They will bring back public order, but that means that someone will end up going to jail, which is woefully inadequate to deal with those that suffer from mental illness. Thank you. We've got time for one more question. The front microphone. Hi, my name is Marissa Cohen. I'm a five foot nine lesbian from New Jersey. So um, I probably would guess that I would know um, DA Krasner's work um, from, from that end. 
I like you, so that's cool. Um, so I get the gist that everybody's unhappy with law enforcement from some angle. There's something that needs to be done to some degree. But we haven't made any real sort of decisions together here. We've all kind of smirked at each other. So the idea that when we're looking at force, right, the idea of force, we're not just stuck with what you said, Mr. Scott, on deadly force, because if you look, we have things like Ren v. United States, right? We have California v. Acevedo. You could be pulled over on the side of the road, like Jay-Z said, going 55 in the 54, and be license registration, get out of the car, handcuffed, and brought to jail for going one mile per hour over the speed limit. Right, and it didn't matter. Two okay, one sorry. More so, qualified immunity, question mark. What are we going to do about it? Should we let, or is there some other way that we can enforce policing on police officers, some sort of reform that isn't defund the police? but it's something else, because if people are talking about defunding the police, there's an issue there that doesn't lie within right. the extremes. Qualified immunity, pro and con. I'll just jump in and say, regardless of your position on qualified immunity, let's say that you're actually in favor of it, it really won't do much in a world in which uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Monell still stands, uh, because having individual officers be liable in a world in which there is not barely money to pay the, those judgments um, is not going to incentivize anybody to change their behavior. So essentially, if you're going to get rid of qualified immunity, you also have to create respondeat superior liability uh, for cities, which means we have to get rid of Monell. And I say dump it, and I say dump it for prosecutors too. We have, there are prosecutors in this country who have been serial kidnappers who have time and time again hit evidence to which the other side was entitled, and we find 25 years later an innocent person in jail based on DNA and a guilty person who got away and will never, ever, ever be accountable because they've passed away or they disappeared or, or whatever it is. I, we need to take all of these special protections in a system that's supposed to be equal away from government, even if it turns out that it doesn't have a practical effect. It has an important symbolic effect because it says we are not a caste system. All right. Any last words? Well, I want to thank you all, but before you go or applaud, I want to remind you that there's going to be the Antonin Scalia Memorial Dinner. There will be a reception at 6 o'clock and dinner at 7 o'clock at Union Station. And with that, please thank our panelists for exceptionally stimulating. <laughs>